Hello. 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 A million hellos for me. Hey, it's Nikki. Welcome to Nikki Nights. How you doing? I hope you're having a great day. You sure deserve to. And if no one's told you yet today, you're wonderful. Speaking of wonderful, um, just a little PSA from yours truly. Speaking of wonderful, my guest today, Ryan Russell. What an insightful, incredibly charming and just beautiful soul. What a lovely young man. Here's my chat with Ryan Russell. We talked everything from football to his social activism to everything. I can't wait for you to hear it. Here it is. Ryan Russell. Hello, everyone. It's me, Nikki. So this is number four, and I'm going to bring in my fourth guest. Hello, Ryan Russell. Hi. Wait. I don't think my volume's on. Hello. Hello. There we go. I can hear you. <laughs> Welcome to my backyard. <laughs> Welcome to my home office. <laughs> right. I know. We're all kind of doing this now, right? Yeah. It's been, it's been crazy. <laughs> Where are you right now? Los Angeles, the city of angels, sunshine, and a beach I can't go to. I know. I've heard. My friends have been calling me from LA. They're like, come on out. I'm like, why? I can't go to the beach. So what? The whole I sit there like yeah, exactly. The whole reason I moved here, I can't even, I can't even do it anymore. But how are you? Where are you at? I'm in New York, so I'm kind of in like the epicenter of the mayhem. Um, you know, mm -hmm. people are just losing it daily over here, but it's fine. Yeah, I have family in New York. It's my mother is in New York, and she, I mean, she's safe because she's making sure that she's yeah. safe. <laughs> Some lady popped off at me at the line at Starbucks the other day because, you know, my dad, my, first of all, my father is, he's a lovely man. I can't drive to save his life. And he, <laughs> he cut some lady off and she just popped off. And I was just like, we're all going to get, we're all going to get our coffee. First of all, it's not essential. Okay. <laughs> Number two, let's just not make it more difficult for each other right now. You know? Yeah. Let's just all make this as, as, easy and as seamless as it possibly can with the circumstances. You know, my mother, to... she, I guess my niece or something came to her and she was just like, she just looked like a ball of germs. So my mother said she just ran in the other direction. <laughs> really? Well, yeah, I know. It wasn't it's, her, it's always tough. You know, my mom worked at an elementary school growing up and would you believe at like 45 she got the mumps? Mm. I mean. Oh my God. Crazy kids are kids are great, but they are little germ balls. <laughs> they are, yeah. I, no kids over here. Don't need any anytime soon. I'm good. <laughs> right, I feel you. I'm in the same exact boat. Everybody's like, "When are you gonna get married and have kids?" I'm like, "Oh, honey, please, no, no, no." <laughs> there, movies need to be made and things need to happen before Nikki's nursery opens. <laughs> I got a lot to do for. for well, me. you've been doing a lot. Oh my gosh, so. You are an incredible football player. Has this always been a passion for you? Yes and no. Uh, I started football very young, um, comparative. So I grew up in Dallas. So of course, okay. everyone like comes out the womb with a football. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I moved there later. So I didn't get into football until high school really seriously. And by the time colleges like knew about me and saw me, they were like, where have you been? You know, Texas and like big schools like that recruit so far in advance yeah so me having my first full season being like junior year junior senior year they're just like what how did we miss you <laughs> yes but then it's been, i mean the rest is history i guess <laughs> i love that though because i didn't really get into like theater theater heavy until like middle school senior you know senior yeah. year and then high school that's when i started to really go hard yeah, I think that's a good time to get into things. I think as a kid, I mean, you just do things mostly for fun, right? Like I didn't, uh, even in high school, I didn't see football really as a career just yet. I think when I got my scholarship, I was like, oh, wow, okay, this can like transform my life. Yes. But I never got into it just for the love of it and for the fun. I get that. I mean, I grew up playing softball. I played nine years of softball and people are always so intrigued and they're like, wait, you played softball? I'm like, Did, didn't know I was athletic. <laughs> um, yeah. And not just, I was the catcher. It was so fun. My parents were my coaches, like head oh, and assistant. Yeah. The nonsensory that went on. <laughs> I love nonsensory. I love that. I don't even know what that means, but it's we just have so much fun. And when you're part of a team, you know, it makes it. And now that I'm like 
kind of a, an actor and I'm solo, you know, it makes having a team, you know, so much more um, valuable because now I can't, I'm like, the only people I can count on are my co-stars. So that is kind of like a team. Mm -hmm. So you're- Yeah, definitely. Team I think, I, I mean, when I grew up, it was, yeah, when I grew up, it was just me and my mom, like mostly. So for me, a team was like a chance to have a family, you know, it was a chance to have like a ton of brothers to, you know, just freaking make fun of and, and rough house with and, and do all that and then accomplish some really cool moments and some really great things. So I mean, team really was, for me, team was synonymous with family. And that's kind of what drew me to football as well. I mean, I grew up in a football family. Okay. So this was our Thanksgiving. It was, I didn't exist. Nope. <laughs> no. I was just there to like wash the dishes at the end and just help make the stuffing. You know, it was not, I mean, I was the only girl out of six grandchildren. Mm. My grandfather played semi-professional football. Um, his cousin was one of the original Chicago Bears, uh, Rudy Smeja. And then my uncles played like um, all state and all county. So, I mean, you know, me, I would just sit there like, is it intermission yet? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is, what is happening? There's so many numbers. And I mean, it's intense. What is it? I oh, can't yeah. even imagine. I know what it's like to perform and get out on a, you know, sing and in front of people. But to play ball, that's got to be a whole other level of pressure. Well, it, it, it is, but it isn't. I think, I think as there's a performance aspect to it. As a performer, I think you understand just the preparation that goes into it and how these moments are so big and so monumentous and really still at the end, just moments. I mean, they pass, they go, you have to look for your next gig, just how I have to prepare for my next game. Yeah. Um, I think the part where it becomes very interesting for athletes is just the physical aspect of it too. I mean, we can't do this forever someone can necessarily you know work a nine to five longer than they can play football or act more like or write or whatever it is um so there's a, an interesting life um expectancy for a football player and just your health and knowing that the things that you do for the game that you love can also affect you in the long term um which all adds an exciting honestly risk to everything that you're doing you know i mean that's the beauty in life is that it it comes and it goes it begins and it has an ending and there are things that supersede us um, same with football. So it's, it's, it's intense. I think that's the best way to describe it. I know people just might be tired of hearing that word, <laughs> but it's just, it's, it's, it's a way of life and it's so much ingratiated in who we are as athletes and the love that we get from fans and from, I mean, there's been people following, like when I got drafted by the Dallas Cowboys, there are families who have, as long as they remember, have rooted for the Dallas Cowboys. And I'm like new to this organization feeling very, I'm just fresh and like unsure and there are people letting you know like, like no matter what literally our whole family tree supports you <laughs> like yeah regardless of anything regardless of the color of your skin or your sex whatever your name says on the back of your jersey really doesn't doesn't block you from receiving our support and our love and I think that is just a great bonding um force in sports that it's it's really the beauty of sports absolutely well sports has that thing that food and music has like it doesn't matter your religion, your race, what creed, it just, it brings you together. And if it bonds you, it bonds you. And literally, I mean, you look, perfect example, you look at the game that Ellen DeGeneres was sitting next to George Bush. I yeah. mean, in, in what world was that ever going to happen? Like people sit together. They're, I've been put in place with, to have conversations with people that I know without football, I would not be able to have conversations with. I mean, even kind of this in a way, like, I would not be given these great, amazing opportunities, friendships, mentorships, brotherhoods, um, relationships, whatever it is, without sports. And like you said, it's just good, a good movie or a good act also has that quality where I can sit next to someone and we can watch the same thing. And it can be a life that I've never experienced. It could be a struggle that personally I've never dealt with. And we could both be sitting here in tears or, you know, sitting here busting out laughing over something. It's, it's these great things that just speak to to our humanity really and into the heart of what it means to be human and that's very connective. Absolutely and you spoke about mentors who was like somebody you know I always talk about Dr. Pamela Levy she was my mentor <laughs> who was that for you? When I was drafted in 2015 to the Dallas Cowboys I borderline stalked Jason Witten like he is not just a cowboy just 
icon and legend, an NFL legend, you know, like, and, yes. and out, I mean, on the field, just always produced, was always reliable and accountable and a leader off the field the exact same way. You know, he, he does a lot off the field for abused and battered women. He has a nonprofit organization. Wife, dude, he was a great father. Every time I saw him, a mentor. I mean, he was, I was just like, this is what I want to be. And I have the opportunity to work with this man every day and to go against him some days. And like, just, I, it was borderline stalking. I just watched everything he did. I kind of waited until he was undoing it and then did it all like myself. <laughs> you I know, and it's, though. I mean, yeah, because you have to, like, I, I didn't grow up with a father in the home. My, my biological father wasn't in my life. My stepfather passed away um, when I was seven due to a motorcycle accident. And this was like a close feeling to having a male figure in my same field with um, just values and morals that I shared and valued myself. And I got to see him day in and day out do what he loves and be the person that, that he wanted to be and that he dreamt of being. And it was, it was just such a great experience for me. So I definitely, he, there are other people, but he's just the first person that comes to mind because it's like, I mean, it's Jason Witten. <laughs> well, sure. When you have somebody that you look up to and then, you know, you say, I get to work with you. Maybe I'm going to not copy what you do, but emulate. You know, yeah. and that's how I was very much with John Travolta and Ricky Lake. You know, I'm not going to copy what they do, but I'm going to emulate the way John has, you know, the way John treats his fans and his, um, his, you know, his crew. I mean, everybody is just family and he's just wonderful. So when you have those people and you see people acting a certain way, it inspires yeah. you to act, you know, and follow suit. Of course. And I think, I think, like you said, it's, it's not necessarily copying. I, I, I shouldn't have used that word. It's it's things that oh no, that I, I say that, that because I, <laughs> I say that because people say to me all the time, "You're copying Ricky Lake by having a talk show," and I'm like, "No, it is very different. We are yeah, very but, different women." And there are things, there are little things in each of us that calls to each of us, and it's like you pick it up maybe or emulate it because it's in you. You know what I'm saying? Like you yes. pick it in, get from that person and, and then put it in you. you you have this this bond, this connectivity, this quality that that shines in both of you. So of course, I mean, if someone says you're, you know, I'm copying Jason Whitney and Ray Lewis and Bruce Smith and all these, I'm like, great, those are great people. <laughs> like those exactly. are people I love. Like, there could, honey, there could you. be a lot worse people that we could be following our careers exactly. after. <laughs> exactly. And then and then it's cool because I feel like maybe you get one moment where you see something or someone reaches out to you, you've been, and you look back and you realize you've also been laying great groundwork and great path for someone who maybe was as lost as I was years ago or didn't know which way direction to go or didn't have that mentor or, or that person emulate in their home or, or at their school. So, I mean, it's cool. I, if we're going the right way, I, I don't care who I'm following. I don't care who's coming with me. It's just, I'm just glad we're all going this way. Exactly. I say all the time, I'm like, listen, the SS Blonsky set sail a long time ago. <laughs> you know, whether you got off or not, that's not my problem. You know, it's just, you got to keep exactly. it moving and you got to keep it going at all times. I mean, sure. what's been one of the craziest fan experience? Because I mean, we're in movies, so we get some intense experiences. But yeah. you guys, I mean, there's nothing like a football fan. My goodness. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I will say, people's creativity just always kicks me on my toes. <laughs> it's the nicest way I've ever heard of, <laughs> of calling insanity creativity. I love it. You're great. <laughs> there's crazy. I mean, I've 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 had all of the standard experience between like going to restaurants and having my meal comp, where I'm like. Now I can actually afford a meal. Where were you yeah. when I was broke? But you know, all this, it's all great. Um, I've had paintings and, and drawings sent to me of pictures from me playing games, uh, which is awesome. I've had guys play out scenes of like plays, like my sack and Drew Brees, then send me a video on Instagram of them like their brother in a Drew Brees jersey and them in like my jersey and like sacking him. I mean, there's so many different things. Of course, messages, um, letters that come to the practice facility, um, all those things, I guess, become kind of standard. But I'm always in awe of it. Anytime someone especially takes that time to reach out and just let you know that they appreciate you and what you do and, and everything that you're putting your work into and your livelihood into um, is amazing. I've had young kids who, like, I, like me, didn't have fathers and, and said they look up to me and they feel like I'm a male role model for them. And that's always just powerful in it. And in a sport, especially in any career where you're a public figure or your or your job or what you do, your craft is open to public opinion. 
right. you kind of get used to almost being beat down. Like you, 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 I know that I go into stadiums and I leave games expecting to hear everything I did wrong, you know, and expecting to like be booed and expecting these things. And I don't think people understand just those little sentiments of just like, whether you win or lose, whether it's best performance or not your best performance, those little sentiments of just like, I you and I love you and I support you go such a long way. Like we're not larger than life. The NFL is larger than life, but I'm not larger than life. You know, like you can say whichever you want about the shield. And at the end of the day, games will still be played. Money will still be made. People still show up. But when you say something to a human being, like that has an effect. And we get so used to the negative effects that when the positive comes, it's just that much more amazing and powerful. So I appreciate every letter I ever got. I appreciate every crazy message of support I ever got. Every painting, every video, every, you know, I'm walking down the street, someone runs up to me, oh my God, hi, you're that guy. Take I love all of that. I appreciate all of that. And I don't think it gets said enough. I agree. And, you know, I did an event years ago with this guy who, I, I, I never named names, but he was a singer at the time. And this kid, this young girl was so excited. I, I hadn't done Hairspray yet. And this young girl was so excited because we were both singing. And he sang, uh, like, I don't know, America the Beautiful or something. And I sang God Bless America. And she said to him, can I please have an autograph? And she was so thrilled. And he was like, I had a horrible day now. And he just like snapped at her and this girl sat there crying. And yeah. I vowed ever since then, I said, I don't care what, you know, yes, we are human beings and there are some tough things that we have to go through. We have to get through the same struggles that everybody else. But okay. it always shocks me when people are always like, but this isn't what I signed up for. Yes, it is. It is, you know, you know it did. It why would you sign up for it? And they'd be like, okay, but you are that person that you, it, it'll be exactly the way you want all the time. You know, right. I mean, there, there are positives and negatives to every industry. I, I know I'm very conscious of, if I had a bad game, you can ask my, my whole family could be visiting. My mother would know, uh, she would come to my room, look at me after a bad game. I'd look at her and she'd go back out there and be like, okay, guys, we're all just having dinner here at the house. Or, okay, you know, I'll take y'all out, but Russ, he's tired. You know, he's going to go to sleep. Like, because I don't, I also don't want to put myself in a situation where I feel like I'm not representing, not even these people in the NFL and football, representing myself in a way. And yeah, you, you, you're allowed to have bad days and you're allowed to not um, want to take a picture or take a photograph, but there's a kindness that comes with your job. And there's a kindness in being, a pu having a public uh, job and being a public figure, being a very visible person where people look up to you. There's, there's a kindness in that. And you, to anyone who says, I didn't choose this, it's like, but, but you did. You, you knew. <laughs> well, I always go back to what my grandmother used to tell me as a kid. She used to say, Nikki, treat people the way you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And I think, look, if I'm out and I see that one person that I'm like, whoa, I look up to this person, I would love to be able to know that I could approach them, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and there have been a few. <laughs> That I've had to just, you know, I had to just do it. My teenage self, I had to do it. Who was that for you? Who was like somebody in high school that like you looked up to that maybe you met now because of football that it just blew your mind? Oh my God, Ray fans? Lewis. It was Ray Lewis. <laughs> he honestly, the um, just the 2000s and really even going on to them, Baltimore Ravens were kind of the reason I got into football. That was the time where. They were they won the Super Bowl and you know Ray Lewis was there every. There's something in the water in Baltimore. Yeah, and and Terrell sucks. I mean, I was just like, they're killing it. They're monsters, and I yeah. I wanted to play defense, and and they were kind of that reason why. So I always looked up to Ray Lewis. I had all of his quotes. He's also a man of faith, which I was very much um, a man of faith at that time. And and I was just like, this is my guy. This is my guy. This is my guy. And um, of course, he retired before I got into the NFL. So I was like, okay, I was like that. I probably won't be able to meet him. And I was at the Super Bowl. I won't say it was 48. It was Atlanta Falcons versus the New England Patriots in Houston. Wow. And my best friend, who still plays for the Falcons now, he was starting, um, Ricardo Allen, and he got us tickets, me and my mom. And I'm in the stands getting ready for the game. Like, the game hasn't even started. And Ray Lewis just walks by. We're, like, in the family section. I don't know if he knew someone on the team. And he just walks by, and I freeze. And my mother's like, what? What is it? What? And my mom's a huge Randy Moss fan, so she's like, is it Randy? I was like, it's not Randy. <laughs> Get off of me. It's Ray Lewis. And I 
it took me so long to go walk up to him. Like he circled. I was like, okay, if he comes back, it's meant to be. Like I'll talk to him. He comes back like four times, and I haven't talked to him yet. <laughs> yeah. And then he's talking to a family literally like next to me, and I, it's as simple as just like, hey, Ray Lewis, I'm Ryan Russell. You know, like I play for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'm just a huge fan of you. I just wanted to shake your hand. And he was very kind and very nice, and, and he shook my hand. And it, and it was, of course, he has a massive hand too. So we're like both crushing each other's hands. And my mother took a like a little picture of it, like a selfie. I didn't I didn't want to be that person to ask him for a picture? Back, I definitely should have asked him for a picture. <laughs> but that he was my person. It was just like he. Yeah, he was the one, like, he was that guy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's like that weird thing in high school, you know, when you're in high school and you're near, like, the either the cute people or the popular people, and you'll find any reason to talk, yeah. like, to stir up conversation. You're like, this guy, you, oh, yep, you mentioned Blue? Well, this guy. And you're like, <laughs> let me have a conversation with this person. I did that with Angelina Jolie. Oh, I, yeah, I would, too. <laughs> I was like, I, I was standing there. It was commercial break at the SAG Awards, and I was like, well, you know, you only get one shot. You d when are you going to run into her again? You don't know. And I, I know. shot it. I shot my shot. And she was like the nicest woman. And she looked at me. And she was like, Tracy Turnblad. And I went. <gasps> and she was like, I have to thank you. And I said, thank me. for What, what, what could Angelina really have to thank me about? You know? And she said, before we left the house, my kids came up to Brad and I. And it was, she was pregnant with the twins at this point. And she said, um, the kids were like, mom, you have to put on hairspray before you leave. She said, so we left them with that. She said, but they came up to us a couple of days ago and they said, mom, how come, you know, Seaweed and Tracy can't dance together? She said, and that sparked a whole conversation about integration and segregation. She said, and as you know, we're an integrated family, she said, and we really didn't talk about it, it that yeah. much before then. She said, so you started the conversation and Brad and I sat down with the kids and gave them like a whole hour long history lesson and it was a whole conversation. And I was just like, and she, was, she looked at me and I was just like, thank you so much. That's incredible. I loved you and Girl Interrupted. <laughs> really? <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> you have those moments. She was that actress for me in high yeah. school, you know? Yeah. She was that, like, um, that badass, you know, woman. And she still is, you know? Still and she's day. just killing it. Yeah, that's amazing. There's definitely people, honestly, also just walking in L.A. I am very, I'm very happy to be here. I feel as a creative and as a writer, my spark in Los Angeles has just ignited into a whole fire. And I will be at a coffee shop and like Jake Gyllenhaal will just come sit down. I'm just like, like, is this real life? Like pinching myself, like, is this real? Should I speak? Should I not speak? <laughs> and there's just these people that, I mean, entertainment, like I said, the entertainment industry and really just film and theater, it, it starts conversations that maybe we would never have. It gives you emotions and life experiences. And though you can't, you can't live those experiences, some of them may be in a segregated, you know, world or being black man or being a woman or whatever it is, but you get to empathize. You get to see the journey. You get to understand a little more and it starts these conversations. There are also films that like Ryan Murphy makes that shows us maybe a world or what the world could be like or a different perspective of the world. You know, it gives us an option to see, hey, maybe if we did A, B, and C, the world would be more like this. And isn't this what you want? And that's, I mean, that's amazing. That's, it's it's so powerful. And, and I, I appreciate what you do and I appreciate from oh. hairspray to everything, even having these conversations. I mean, I, I love to talk to people who don't do what I do and don't look the way I look and don't love you. I love because that's how I grow and that's how I learn. There are experiences I'll never have, but that doesn't mean I can't learn about them. That doesn't mean exactly. I can't empathize with them. You know, you I'll never fully know what it's like to be Ryan Russell. You'll never know what it's fully like to be Nikki Blotsky or we'll never know what it's like to be Tom Cruise. But if we empathize and show compassion, and just care about each other and just literally say, would I want you to do that to me? Not really. I always, I have a saying and it's awful. Okay, are you ready? But this is my yeah. saying. And I wanna have t-shirts made because I'm a lunatic. <laughs> I tell people all the time, don't be a dick, it's not that hard. That's it's simple. not. It's 
really that simple. People that are nasty and mean have to go out of their way. Like it's not, you're making a conscious effort. Like you said, to be a dick. (laughs) How exhausting that must be. It's so exhausting. That's why I tell people now, I was like, I just, I forgive people and I move on because holding a grudge takes so much time and so much just mental space and energy. And I don't have time for it. I don't want that for me. Like, I don't want that for them. I just forgive and move on. I tell people all the time, I'm just like, God bless. <laughs> I have a friend. I have a friend. She says to me, she goes, every time you say that, she's like, I just roll my eyes. I swear, they've like rolled all the way back down the street. She's like, oh, Lord. But it's true. You have to combat idiotness with, you know, some some human decency and it's not that difficult i it mean kind. <laughs> that's what my grandma used to say i love your grandma, I love your grandma. <laughs> yeah, she was she was on target peggy spade was on target but to be, i mean so you i was just looking at your cover of the advocate handsome my goodness gracious I do not look like that in real life. <laughs> Wait, are you kidding? I look at my graphic and I'm like, what happened? Where did she go? <laughs> no. I'm like, huh? Who stole her? Who kidnapped her in the middle of the night? You know? <laughs> Lord, it's like a heist. I swear. I like your cover came out. I'm like, who's? <laughs> I mean, I did Out Magazine and that was incredibly fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Advocate was. Where did you shoot that? It's just fun to play dress up. Um, West Hollywood is actually in uh, Luke Fontana's apartment. Like he has like a studio apartment, like have to, you know, and it, mm-hmm. we just walked around, we went down the street a little bit, we shot there and it was fun. I don't find many clothes that fit me. Like I, I, I'm not gonna go into this whole long thing because I, I love my body and I accept that, but just being a football player, not many clothes fit. I don't really go to department stores and just like pick things off the rack and leave with them. <laughs> well, I feel your pain, trust me. <laughs> So it was fun to have like a stylist come with a rack of clothes and it's like, okay, these will fit. And you get to kind of play dress up and things that didn't fit. He took back and brought things that fit. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> it eliminates a whole level of stress. Yeah, exactly. Really just jeans. Jeans are like my nightmare because I got like thighs and like hips and ass, but then, but it's, and then my waist is kind of, it's weird. I'm just built. I always I'm just tell for people. Football, not for fashion. <laughs> Well, you look amazing, but I always tell people, I'm like, this is how I think it went in God's mind when he was creating me. Okay, we're going to make you fierce. You're going to, yep, we're going to give you some talent, a decent face. And then he was like, but I'm going to unbalance you. You're going to be real short and a big ass and big (laughs) boobs. So you're going to walk like a weebles wobble, don't fall down. You know, like, I'm always like teeter tottering. But, you know, we have to love our bodies. We only get one, you know? We have to. And it's, I mean, I'm not going to go out of my way to try to change it. I feel like it's easier just to try to love it. I mean, I will work, you know, be healthy and make sure I'm eating correctly, you know, doing all that stuff. But, oh, my God, I have a, I wear a size 15 shoe. I don't know. That's not, like, public knowledge. But my mother growing up, that was, like, the bane of our existence, just finding me shoes i was 13 wearing a size 13 i was 14 wearing a size 14 i was 15 it was like growing at that capacity she was like i should have known my kidneys still hurt from you kicking me in the (laughs) world it's just i i hated my feet growing up i i absolutely hated them i was pigeon-toed i was tripping over myself it was it was hell and then once i kind of figured out hey this is cool i get to wear shoes that other people don't wear i get to make statements and of course it helped me in football i was just freaking picking up so much turf and grass when i was running i was covering so much ground i was like god gave me these feet for a reason i'm gonna love them because they're not going anywhere (laughs) if anything they're gonna get bigger (laughs) let me tell you i am a size you're going to lose it i mean my converse are a size four three and a half four in kids yeah like little itty baby feet, like really little feet. Um, and I'm only four foot ten. I know. <laughs> so I literally, I've gotten my Converse at like I've walked in with my best friend. I walked into a, a like famous footwear or something in Times Square, picked a three and a half off no. the rack, popped them on from the kids section, and he was so angry. He was like, "That cost you thirty five dollars and took four uh-huh. minutes." He's oh like, that would take me forever and like $80. I like, will say now, you know, once my feet did stop growing, I made a little monkey money. I started 
um, like a little shoe collection. Like I do have like a shoe thing. Yes. Like, my shoes stop growing. I can wear these shoes forever. And I have so many sneakers, but it's still very hard to one find pairs that fit like during release dates and things. And the fact that you you're good, you're golden. You can just walk in and grab anything and leave. And like you said, thirty dollars. I haven't nothing I put on my feet has been thirty dollars since I was like shopping at Ross, like as a little kid getting freaking only who Lord who knows and putting it on my feet. <laughs> I mean, what was, I mean, and so did you grow up in a big town or was it a small town, a pretty small town? Uh, I grew up in a, it was decently small, it was Carrollton, Texas. So I moved to seven after my stepdad, stepdad passed away. And it's like a suburb of Dallas. It's like 20 minutes north of Dallas, maybe less now that there's so many tollways in Dallas, but that's beside the point. Um, so it was relatively small. I walked to school. I walked to elementary school, middle school, and high school. I knew pretty much everyone that I went to school with, even though the schools were pretty big. Uh, but it felt very, it felt very small to me, especially moving out here and not having a car and not having like resources. Like I couldn't really get around like everyone else. So it 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 definitely felt small. But at the same time, no matter whether I was one kid in a room of five hundred or two kids, you know, in a room of five, I always kind of felt very disconnected. And I think that's, like I said, that's what drew me to football because it was the one time where I could go somewhere, put on a jersey, put on a helmet, and at instantly I was a part of a team and part of a family and a part of a community. And I always kind of long for that. I grew up as a single child, just me and my mom. And Though me and my mom, I mean, we're thick as thieves. We talk for an hour every day on FaceTime, religiously. <laughs> but okay. as a little kid, you know, you want you want, you want people to play with. You want friends. You want people that look like you and sound like you and are going through the same stage of life as you um, to connect with. And that's that's what football gave me. Because for a long time, I felt very dis disconnected from the world around me, really. I get that. I felt extremely ostracized in high school as well. I was the only kid who... Um really looked the way I did, you know, super short, curvy, but also, you know, I was just, when the kids were getting reckless with like, you know, after the school shows, yeah. um, they used to call me safety police because they would all be, you know, smoking their weed and, and drinking. And I was like, uh uh, no, I have to go home and rehearse for the next show, you know? Definitely. I mean, you have to keep your eye on the prize. It's the same way. Football kept me, out of trouble. kept me out of so much trouble. Football is because I was like, I had a built-in excuse. And football being like the cool masculine sport, like no one really, I guess, questioned it. So anytime my friends were doing something, I was just like, oh, I can't. Like I, I have football. Like I, I can't do that. I can't drink. I can't, you know, I can't smoke weed. You know, I get drug tested. I was just like, I can't. And everyone's like, oh yeah, like that's that's cool. Like we respect yeah. that. So I got I got off easy in that aspect. When really I was like, regardless of sports, I am not doing this. <laughs> my mother would kill me. <laughs> exactly. You're like, you know, it's one thing to get in trouble with the principal or somebody in school. No. But like my grandmother used to tell my mother in school, Karen, if you get in trouble, you will get it twice as worse when you come home. So oh, don't yeah. come home and tell us. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and my mother was the, I would say like, just the element of surprise worked very much in, in our household. Because I, I never got it right when I told her. You know, I would maybe be sleeping or maybe later or maybe I would get it just periodically throughout a month or Eat whatever it is. Later. Yeah, and anytime, anytime I got it, I, I didn't even ask. She just gave me this look like, you know what that's for. And I was like, I know. I know what it's for. Yes. Yes. I mean, my mother was, um, she, I mean, there's something between a mother, also in our household, you know, it's two very strong women living in the same household. But I also think when you just have two passionate people and when there's love there, you know, um, yeah. So no matter how much our mothers will drive us nuts, they're always going to be our best friends, and we're lucky oh, for it. Yeah, always. I I need. I mean, my mother's my constant like barometer as well. Like, we are very passionate and emotional people, both of both, both me and her. And I mean, there are times where I need to be put in check. There are times where I need to be told what's yeah. what, and and I love it because no matter what she says, it always. <laughs> from a place of love and we just have this foundation so I mean she can she can say anything and I know what she's saying isn't because you know she's a peer trying to hold me back or she's someone on the internet hating you know she's not she's my mother she literally just wants the best for me and that's that's 
that's that's amazing. Sometimes she's a little over the top, and then I have to also be like, okay, mom, I'm, oh, I got true. it. <laughs> I my got mother it. comes up to me the other day, right? And I'm in my I'm in my kitchen, and she goes, "Can I ask you a question?" I know that's the premise for. Here we go. Here goes my afternoon. And I go, yes, mom. And she goes, um, she goes, that lipstick though. <laughs> she goes, did you, did you buy that? I said, yes, yes, mom, I did. She goes, and was there like, was somebody else wearing it? I said, no, I just saw it. And I like, she goes, okay, it's a choice. I said, it's a choice. She was, she goes, well, it just, it looks a little, yeah, my mom doesn't think that. She goes, it looks a little blurry. <laughs> like, what? Like, oh, tell me how you really feel. <laughs> oh, Karen Blosky does not hold back. I was like, seriously, mom, really? I mean, but there, when you love somebody, you know, you do tell them. I mean, it's like that thing when you got lipstick on your teeth. If you love them, you're going to tell them immediately my mother has never hesitated <laughs> and there'll be times where i'm just like okay i hear you but i i don't i i can't do this right <laughs> yes you have to know uh, when to fold and i love it because my mom i mean she will do the same thing she'll ask a question but it, your mom sounds like she gives follow-up my mom will just end it there with like a mm. i'm just like wait what i'm like what else <laughs> like, right. what, what do i do from here what's wrong <laughs> she's like oh is that and she's like, that's the whole statement. That's it. I'm just like, yeah. mm. I'm like oh my God. Okay. I love it. She puts out a press release and that's it. She's like, I'm not following this up with any other follow up questions. <laughs> what you get is what you get. I said what I said. <laughs> I mean, well, it makes me wonder, though, God, if I ever was to become a mother, what kind of mother would I be? <laughs> Oh, I pray. I pray for the child that I one day have in my household. And I mean, I hope that just they know I'm trying to figure it out just as much as they're trying to figure it I'm out. And we're going to do our best together. <laughs> what I'm going to do is if I ever have a child and they look at me and say, why are you like this or why are you doing this to me? It's very simple. Have you met your grandparents? That's it. But grandparents, once a parent becomes a grandparent, they switch it all up for the grandkids. They oh. switch it all up. <laughs> oh. Are you kidding? I know my brother's kids are going to be like getting carte blanche of everything. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to get yelled at. Nobody's going to ever have to do anything. I'm like, uh, it's the pits. Because my, my mother grew up with um, my grandmother is a Jamaican woman. She moved here when she was super young by, by herself, with her sister, but she had no father. Her mother died very young, sadly, to cancer. And the grandmother that my mom describes to me is nothing like my sweet, loving, gentle grandma <laughs> that I grew up with and experienced. She has the cute Jamaican accent. She cooks all the food for us, all the jerk chicken, the red beans and rice. Oh. She's never... She's never harmed a fly. She never touched hair on my head. And my mother describes a complete stranger to me. <laughs> right. I mean, my nanny, I'll tell you, you know, that when you go back to like people in that era that were like, you know, born in the 50s or my mother was born in the 50s. So my grandmother was born in the 20s. When you, when you, there's like a level of, I don't know, there's a whole other aura. And my nanny used to have all these sayings and she was just the cutest lady. And yes, I remember one time I heard her say shit. And mm. I thought, I was like, I went, man. And she was like, oh, and she was from Boston. She said, oh, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. <laughs> she was mortified. I mean, it, and now forget it. I'm out there curling like a sailor on Fleet Week, you know, cursing. I mean, come on. <laughs> No, there are certain things where I'm still just like, huh, I hope my grandma doesn't hear this. Where I'm like speaking, I'm like, I just hope she doesn't hear this. She's so sweet and innocent. And my mom's like, not your grandmother. Yes, <laughs> I mean, my nanny's in heaven, so I know she can hear everything I say. So I need to be careful. I need to just watch my tongue. Where, where would you like to see yourself in like 10, five, 10 years? Oh, wow. Five, ten. Let me just start at five because 10, I'd be 38. I have no idea. I literally, I, I know. I pray too. for that person. I have no idea where they're going to be or what they're going to be doing. I have no idea. In five years, okay, so I would be 32. Oh, wait, no, 33. 
check my math. Hopefully better at math. Hopefully I'll be better at math. Um, <laughs> I would love to, I'm a writer. I'm, I'm right now I'm working on my memoir and just my story. I would love to have been, I think on at least a second or third book by then. I would love to have a nonprofit organization that helps LGBTQ plus athletes and, and help the athlete. You know, there are some organizations out there in educating, um, you know, teams and educating businesses and educating um, the structure. But I really want to create something that supports the athlete as an individual and kind of creates their own team, you know, their own little brotherhood, kind of like a fraternity. Um, so oh. I think in five years, I think that's a great goal to have. I would, I mean, everything progressing with my relationship as amazingly as it has been and you know hopefully we are still together and I don't want to jinx everything now because now I'm feeling superstitious but you know hopefully that just continues to grow and be filled with love and kindness um yeah I mean I, I think I'll still be in LA by then I really am enjoying my time here I've only been here for a year and I'm not I'm not done with it yet um but all, other than that I just want to be surrounded by people I love and hope that I'm giving them the same love that that I'm receiving and, and just make this world a brighter place for everyone who encounters me and who and I encounter. Um, so five years. Yeah. I think, I think that's a lot. I think that's good. Absolutely. Five years. It's absolutely doable. I mean, I, this is our first time meeting, meeting, but I can tell when you put your mind to something, you're one of those people that just like get it done. Oh yeah. And okay. aggravate everyone in the process. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. You have to because you have to make sure it's done right. They always say if you don't, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Boy, if that's not true. Yeah. And we're creating things. It, it really is creation out of almost nothing. You know, you have to make an idea that is purely your own or just purely in your head or in the head of the collective and create it and, and to bring it in life to a medium and not just create it. You know, it, it'd be one thing if we created a film or if we created an act or we created a book. And you just knew that it would be received the exact same way you thought of it. No, now you have to see, is the perception of it, this close to your reality of it, close to your conceptualization of it. Yeah. It's so much like, and people don't understand these things don't come out of nowhere. They are given life by teams and organizations and people um, who believe it and who live it and who have it. And it's a lot, but it is doable. <laughs> and we will do it and we will make, I, I'm, I'm very much attached to making the world to making the world look the way I think it can look and the way I think will benefit the all of us, not even just the majority of us, not even the minority of us, but in, in improve all of us in a world that all of us feel more loved and feel more self-love and feel more self-worth and valued. And it's not easy and it shouldn't be because I, that payout is, is worth it. <laughs> That's what I always tell people when I'm like, when they're like, but how did you, because they think, like you said, they think it happens overnight, success. And I always tell people, you have no idea, you know, how much work goes into it. And just as quickly as it comes, it can be gone. And you have to find, you can be prepared for the future. Live. I like to say, I'm going to be prepared for the future, but I want to live in the now and make you know now work for me but be ready so that when crazy things come i'm not like what you know yeah, exactly I'm, and it's funny because i still have those moments i literally will work for something my whole life and then get it and be like oh my god i never knew <laughs> and it's like you knew you've 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 been on this path you know you've been doing things you've been making sacrifices you've been honing your craft and your skills and your voice and your your creative spark or, or whatever whatever you believe it comes from and yeah, I, I, I enjoy all my moments. I mean, I think people, my family can attest, Corey, my boyfriend can attest. I mean, I love the moments. I, I lost a friend in 2018 to cancer, my best friend. And I understand that, I mean, life is nothing but these moments. You know, I, I, can, I can think about the past and get sad. I can think about the future, but I can't really change any of those two things. I can set myself up for the future. I can cope and deal with my past but everything that's happening is about this moment and all the beauty is in this moment. And I love my moments. I'm a huge foodie. I will go to a restaurant in the heartbeat of some good news and kill a whole menu. I love music. I love live music. I hope one day we can go back to that in concerts. And I, well, mean, I was I, just about to ask you, I love to end with this question because I feel like it's such a, I feel like it can tell me so much about you and everybody at the same time. If you are going out yes. and it is a night, we're going to have some drinks, we're going to let loose. 
what's our go-to karaoke song? <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> um, Rihanna. It's it's always going to be Rihanna. It could be, and depending on how the night is, you know, if we're having a few, to you know, if we're having a little tequila and we're partying up, we're feeling a little, a little spicy, it'll probably be some like, bitch, but I have my money or something. You know, she just, she exudes confidence and she exudes curiosity and I think especially when I'm drinking and having a good time that's the things that bubble up for me and just that badassness of just like this is me and I'm unapologetic about it and I freaking love me and you can love me or you cannot <laughs> so it would definitely be Rihanna anything literally anything <laughs> I hear that I was singing umbrella yesterday I was going hard, <laughs> I was going hard. oh we miss you Riri we do but I'm sure I'm sure she's coming back Give us more music. <laughs> She's living her life. I love to see her happy. I love to just see her doing her thing and enjoying all the success that, like, like you said, we know how much goes into things like that. So I know she has put a lifetime of commitment out there. So enjoy, take your moments. Enjoy your moments, Rihanna. <laughs> exactly. Enjoy those moments. Well, I've enjoyed this moment with you, Ryan Russell. Me too, very much. You are such a beautiful person inside and out. I'm so glad that we got to connect. When this is all over, I'll come to New York. You come to LA. Let's hang out, please. <laughs> Are you kidding? I follow you and your boyfriend on the TikTok. I call it the TikTok because I'm over 30. Oh my um, God. I don't understand it. That's why I don't have one personally. He, I mean, he, he's an amazing dancer. So like, I understand his yeah. TikTok per se. And then we'll get on there. We'll start scrolling. People are doing skits. People are acting. People are dancing. People are doing fashion. People are... I'm just like, it's too much. <laughs> I feel like, honestly, it's like a full production. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm all in awe of creativity. <laughs> I know. I literally, you know, there are so many different things you could do with it, the effects and all that. I, I, I have a rule. I'm like, you get four takes. Or else you're <laughs> going to sit here, drive yourself up a wall. Well, this didn't look right. That did it. No. And then it just keeps all your drafts right there. So anything, so it's just like a constant reminder, like this took you four hours. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> Dummy, this took you forever. And now you feel like a genius that you wasted your entire afternoon going like this. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, We're just trying to have so fun, fun with it. Just trying to have some fun with it and not take too seriously. And he's honestly been getting a lot of good response from it. So, I, I mean, it's cool. <laughs> I've met a lot of fun people on there. You know, I have a lot of actor friends that are on there and we do at each other and maybe uh, we'll all do at each other. That'd be fun. Let's do it. I'm down. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I adore you, Ryan Russell. And I, you, thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you for all the work that you do in the world and for, you know, paving a way for, um, you know, a path that hasn't really been traveled. And uh, you're doing it, and you're doing it with a smile on your face and, like, the kindest heart in the world. And uh, just everybody just appreciates you for it. Oh, thank you so much. And you, the same with you. I mean, I, I'm so happy just for this opportunity to talk to you. And you are a trailblazer in your own right. And I am just glad to say that I've got to speak with you. You're one of my people now. I'm like, I, I'm so happy. Oh, well, so am I. You are one of my people as well. And thank you so much. You have an amazing day. Thank you. You do the same. Bye. So how incredibly epic is Ryan Russell? I mean, what a gentleman and what a sweet soul. Thank you so much, sir, for such a great chat. I really enjoyed our time together. And I cannot wait to see you in L.A. And when you come to New York, and I got to come to a game. Obviously, I'm a big football fan. Got to support my buddy. Um, guys, Nikki Knights is so incredibly fun. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow for my chat with David Burka. Bye.